I'm Nina Dante, and thank you for joining me for this episode of The Snake Said to the River. So welcome to my corner of the Pacific Northwest. We are right on the threshold between spring and summer. So today we will be identifying wild roses, we'll do some bookmaking, we'll create a summer herbal tea blend, and we will dive into the medieval poem Maiden in the Moor Lay, which involves translating from Middle English. And at the end of this video, I'll perform my original musical setting of that text for you. I'm so glad you're here and I hope you enjoy. Let's head straight to the wild roses. Wild roses like this bush here are one of my very favorite plants and they've just burst into bloom. They are beautiful, always heart brightening, and they smell and taste heavenly. So all wild roses are edible. So this is a wonderful plant to start with for amateur naturalists and foragers because they're super recognizable and easily identifiable with a little bit of research. Humans from many, many parts of the world have been interacting with roses on a culinary, medicinal, artistic, and symbolic level for time out of mind. So they're very firmly rooted in our collective psyche. And in fact, the oldest rose fossil dates back to about 34 million years ago, which far outdates humanity. So this plant has accompanied us during our entire journey as hominids, which is amazing. Let's learn to identify this rose that is native to my part of the Pacific Northwest. It's called the Nootka Rose. Many long trailing boughs grow out of the main trunk of each bush, and they are studded with thorns. Notice its toothed leaves with multiple leaves growing sideways out of each stem and one leaf ornamenting the stem tip, a configuration called pinnately compound. The blossoms unfurl from a classic teardrop rosebud shape and when they arrive, they have five bright pink petals and bright yellow centers. They are a medium size and fit in the palm of my hand. When the petals fall, their five green sepals that cradled each petal are left behind, looking like a star. And in the fall, the rose hip that develops and contains the seeds will be round and blood red. Something to note is that all wild roses, as opposed to cultivated roses, have only five petals and have thorns. So when I'm foraging, I keep in mind that I'm sharing with all the other creatures in the area. And I keep in mind the needs and the health of the plant itself. So I take very little and I spread my foraging out across different bushes. Today, I'm foraging just one blossom for a tea that we'll be making later. Let's head back to my studio and start our songbook project. This project centers around a stunning medieval song called Maidani Nemor Lei. Now, most of the medieval music that we can still perform today, we have because of historical documents called songbooks, or cancioneiros, or chansonniers, etc. And these were just big compilations of the songs of the day with lyrics and music. However, some of these songbooks had only lyrics, perhaps because the tunes were considered really widely known, or perhaps because the scribe wasn't versed in musical notation. So, unfortunately, this was the case for Maiden in the Morle. So originally this was the song, but only the lyrics remain to us. So I've decided to make a tiny one-song songbook for the lyrics of Maiden in the Morle because I love it so much and it's really come to mean a lot to me. So I have all my supplies and materials ready to go. Let's get started. I'm starting by making some pretty detailed guidelines for myself so that my letters and illuminations are relatively uniform. Once my guidelines are complete, I'm using my box cutters to cut out the final shape of the songbook page. I'm going outside to write the text and to draw my illuminations. It's so delicious to write in such an old incarnation of the English language. This era of medieval English is called Middle English. 
I'm using some of the imagery in the song to embellish the page, including a rugged purple moor landscape channeling the highwayman here, a gushing river source, and a wild rose. Of all the medieval texts that I've come across, Maiden in the Moor Lay is my favorite. It's about a medieval woman camping out on the craggy moor all on her own, living off of food she's foraged, drinking from a remote river source, and sleeping on the earth in the open air. There's a real ecstatic quality to it. Now I'm adding watercolor to my drawings. I'm putting down a thin layer of water before I apply the paint for a dreamy effect. I'm also embellishing the page with some gold pen. Thinking of this text within the context of medieval society, it feels to me like the subversive feminist anthem of its day. Women in the medieval era had little to no control over the trajectory of their lives, very few approved outlets for self-expression, and no real social power. There are notable exceptions, but they're notable. With all this in mind, a song invoking wild woman imagery, telling the story of a woman having her own experience in the natural world, is quite a rare find. From historical documents, we know that this song became really popular in the medieval communities where it was circulating, mainly because it caused a fuss in the medieval church, which left a paper trail. Apparently, they were disturbed by the wild woman imagery, calling the song lewd. One bishop wrote an alternate religious text for the tune, trying to get people to stop singing the story of the wild maiden, but clearly this didn't work. So I think I'm at a good stopping point on this project for the moment because the paint needs to dry. So while I'm waiting, I'm going to make something summary from my supply of medicinal herbs. I'm getting ready to mix up my own herbal summer tea blend. And this will be anchored by cooling mint, given depth and sensuality by rose petals, and ornamented with calendula blossoms, which look like little suns in honor of the seasons. Making your own herbal teas is such a fun and approachable way to get to know the different identities and properties of medicinal herbs. And you can really get creative with combining different flavors of herbs that you like, and you can easily make your own medicinally supportive tea by combining herbs whose medicinal actions you want to harness. And you can usually find bulk medicinal herbs at your local witch shop or herbal apothecary and sometimes even your grocery store. Um, so let's get into it. The mixing proportion that I'm going to use for this tea is three units of mint to one unit of rose petal, since rose is extremely flavorful and we just wanted to perfume this mix. I'm eyeballing the calendula since I'm using entire flower heads as sun symbology for the summer, so I can decide how many I want based on how the mix is looking. Just right. Now that I've transferred the herbs to my teapot, I'm pouring boiling water over them and letting them steep for about 5 to 10 minutes. Since mint is quite strong, I don't want it to oversteep. And now I'm straining the herbs out of the tea. Because it's a pretty warm late spring day, I'm gonna make this tea iced. So I'm gonna take it to the fridge and let it cool to about room temperature. And now that the tea has cooled, I'm pouring it over ice. And just for the joy of it, I'm ornamenting it with a sprig of fresh mint and one wild rose blossom that I foraged earlier today. This is so good. I'm really happy with this blend. I think next time I might add even a little more rose, but it's really delicious and it tastes like summer. In addition to all of the many tangible physical health benefits that the rose offers, symbolically the rose is linked to the heart and it seems that it has for much of recorded history. So ritualistically, rose can be used to open the heart to new possibilities, to soothe a wounded heart, and to stimulate the senses in times of stagnation. Why don't we head back to my studio to finish up our songbook project with a little light book binding. Let's go. I'm 
finishing up this songbook project with a little book binding. I actually did the first step last night, which is making the cover, because the glue needed to dry overnight. So I'm going to show you what I did last night and then continue on from there. For the cover of the songbook, I'm using this gorgeous ornamental paper with flower imagery. And the black kozo paper will line the inside of the cover. For the foundation of the cover, I'm using this sturdy white paper. So first, I need to cut everything down to size. Now I need to glue everything together, making sure to cover every bit of the back of the paper. I'm cutting off the edges of the ornamental paper so that when I fold it over, it will look tidy and will be super secure. This glorious tool is called a bone folder, and I use it to flatten and secure paper after I've applied glue like I am here, and also when folding paper to get nice crisp edges on everything. This is probably my favorite handicraft tool because I feel like a medieval scribe when I use it. Now that the cover is all put together, I'm tucking it in between wax paper and leaving it pressing under a bunch of heavy books for the night. I'm picking up today with sewing everything together. I need to first fold the songbook page and cover. I'm using this little guide I made and this awl to create the holes that I'll use to sew the songbook page into the cover. I'm using this green linen thread to sew everything together. It's unwaxed, so I'm applying a coat of beeswax, which just helps anchor the thread to the paper. I love this part, it smells so good. When I first read this text, I thought of the Maenads of ancient Greece. So the Maenads were both quasi-mythological figures and real women in the real world who were followers of the god Dionysus. They're known for these wild rituals they used to have. They would leave their homes where they were confined much of the time, and run off together into nature where they would spend the night dancing and singing and hunting and getting into a kind of wild trance in order to achieve a state called enthusiasm in which they temporarily became one with the god Dionysus. Like the woman and maiden in the Morle, this must have been by definition a subversive act because again, the lives of women in ancient Greece were extremely restricted. So it's really incredible that they were able to slip through the cracks for this sort of cathartic experience every once in a while out in the natural world. Anyway, I just love this text so much. And while I am heartbroken that the original tune is lost, that does make space for modern artists to be part of the ongoing story of the text by writing new tunes for it. This is something that I've done, so I'll be performing my setting of Maiden in the Morle at the end of this video. So I've left the songbook under a few heavy books so that it presses flat. So while I'm waiting for it to settle, I'm going to head outside for a little fresh air and some music.
now that our songbook is complete, we can get into the translation of the text. The English language has gone through many incarnations before arriving at our modern English. And like I mentioned before, Maiden in the Morlay was written in Middle English, which was a medieval version of the language spoken between about 1066 and sometime in the 1400s. So Middle English came right after Old English, which is the language of the epic Beowulf, and right before Early Modern English, which is the language of Shakespeare. Even as an amateur, I have learned so many fascinating things about the English language from reading Middle English texts. It's a super juicy study, so let's get into it. You can see here that each stanza has the same layout with lots of repetition, which works in our favor. In the introductory stanza, the first two lines state, Maiden in the moor lay, in the moor lay, which simply means a maiden lay on the moor, on the moor. This third line says, Sevenist full. Sevenist combines the number seven with the word nist, which means night, so seven full nights. We then repeat the first two lines, Maiden in the moor lay, in the moor lay, and the last line elaborates on the third line, Seven nist des fulla ant a day, seven full nights and a day. Second stanza. First, a statement is made. Wella was hira meta, which means well was her meat, or good was her food. Second, a question is asked. What was hira meta? Meaning, what was her food? What did she eat? Then, a partial response to the question is made, a cliffhanger for medieval audiences. The prima rola and the, meaning the primrose and the. Then it repeats. Wella was hira meta, what was hira meta? And now, in the last line, the question is fully answered. The primrola and the violet. So the primrose and the violet. Both of those are edible wildflowers, so she was out there foraging for food. The third stanza follows the same exact form. Wella was here a drink, means good was her drink. Then a question is asked. What was here a drink? So what was her drink? Partial response. The childa water of the, meaning the cold water of the. Then we go through the form again. Wella was here a drink, what was here a drink? And we end with the full response. The childa water of the well spring, which means the cold water of the well spring. This means that she was drinking from the pure source of a river, so she must have been in a pretty remote location. Final stanza. Wella was here a bower. So good was her bower. The word bower, bower, still exists, and it's used mainly poetically to refer to a shady, peaceful, idyllic place to sleep. But in medieval times, it also specifically referred to a lady's bedchamber. The question is asked, what was here a bower? So what was her bower? Asking where she slept. Partial response, the red rosa ante. So the red rose and the were left hanging. Then the first two lines repeat, Wella was here a bower, what was here a bower? And we get the full response at the end of the song. The reda rosa ante lilie flower, the red rose and the lily flower. So she was sleeping on a bed of roses. The 
Thank you again for joining me on today's journey. This is the first video that I've made like this for my channel and I really loved creating it and I hope that you loved watching it. I'm looking forward to making more videos like this exploring nature and art and story and song and history. So I hope you'll subscribe to my channel and find me on Instagram and TikTok. Until next time, enjoy the world.